This is part two of our safety inspection that we're doing on this 2016 Screaming Eagle Limited. We were finding out that it had a few more little gremlins in it than we were expecting, so the first video took longer. It's split up in two. So let's go get going on the rest of it. Thanks for watching. So everything's looking good with that. Now we're going to check the coolant level because this is a twin cooled vehicle. You just get your fingers in at the corner. There's a top pin and two pins on the side. Just pops off like that. It's a good thing that we're checking the coolant level because you can tell she's low. I'm just going to put that off to the side. Before we look more into the coolant, we're going to get down here to the, the rear master cylinder. I like checking the rear master cylinder for the brake fluid level or brake fluid moisture content because at least the way that it works on my hoist, it's nice and level. So it's easy to pop the top off, not spill anything. And it's also like the hardest to get to. So I imagine if somebody's gonna change the brake fluid, they're probably gonna do the front and less likely in the back. But we just, we get our brake fluid tester. I'm sure you can find this thing on Amazon. You get it in the brake fluid. You turn it on, and right there, we have 0% uh, moisture in this dot four brake fluid. So everything's good there. Another thing that I do is you want to make sure that you don't have any water or brake fluid on top of the rubber seal. So like this is the, bo the bottom. And then you want to peel it off. You see how there's water and crap in there? If this were a black cap, they usually start corroding and getting crappy right around the edges because that's usually brake fluid that works up its way up through like the little bolt holes. And then the, the painted parts get more or less submerged in the brake fluid and then it damages the paint. This one's a chrome one so you don't have to worry about it damaging the paint. But I always do this at all of the services that I do. I pull the rear cap off and the front cap, and then I clean them. I clean them in, and you just submerge them in water. And then the water um, kind of attacks the brake fluid a little bit because the brake fluid is like oily. And if you just hit it with brake cleaner, it seems to take a lot. So I do like the two-step process of toss it in the water, and then it hit it off with brake cleaner and compressed air and then we're going to dry it off and put it back on but you want to put it back on in the same way that it came off it's hard to tell now but it'll have a couple marks on it so that you line it up correctly all right so i've probably forgot to mention because it kind of goes without saying but you want to check the brake fluid level there's usually a sight glass on the side you want to make sure that you're within th that that range but I just use the multi-purpose sol solvent and some water. Um, the multi-purpose solvent I showed you earlier, it was sitting on the table. But with that and compressed air, you can see how it dries up, or at least it cleans the rubber so it's nice and dry. It has two little areas here on the top and side that coincide with the lid. So you want to make sure that you get those back in the same spot. You see that? I'll fit just right on and then you can read the lettering from the right hand side of the vehicle so it does not go on like that it goes on like this and then we already cleaned up the top surface of the master cylinder so everything's looking good there and then we're going to tighten the lid and put her back on but you also want to do this with the front I'll skip that step with the front just so you don't have to watch me do it twice but this is probably one of the most important steps I feel like is just cleaning the brake fluid off the top of the rubber seal because I'm sure everybody out there that has black master cylinders and master cylinder caps you know what I'm talking about as far as the corrosion that happens to that and honestly front brake master cylinders are like $400 new they are not cheap 
So just doing this once a year, like at a service, or however you do your services if you do them yourself, keeps that from happening, so it's really easy. So we're gonna do the tire pressure. If you're not sure what the tire pressure is for your vehicle, it says right on the down tube sticker. This is pretty much regardless for any Harley Davidson or vehicle really. So you just find your down tube sticker. This one is right here and it says what the tire size is and the tire pressure. So it says at the front is a 17 by 3, 36 psi cold. It says that the rear is a 16 by 5 at 40 psi cold. So that's the way that we're going to set it. Your frame tag may not be in that exact same location, but if you didn't know that, when you open the driver's door of your car, it says it right there. And if you wanted to know, and on your motorcycle, it says on the frame tag. So I'm going to do that outside of the view of the camera. I'm just going to do 40 and 36. We're going to lower the bike down a little bit and keep on going. All right, so this is a fairly common situation where I'm assuming that the shifter shaft bolt has gotten loose on the spline shaft coming out of the transmission, making this lever looser than it needs to be. And on a separate situation that there is extra slot horizontally in the shift lever assembly. I see this. I'm just going to go ahead and do it because it's only going to take me like three minutes to do it. Uh, just to tighten this up, make sure that that is the problem back there and tight, tighten this up. I want this thing to look right and feel right, especially when I test ride it. I don't want this thing to be noisy like this. After I go ahead and do this, if there's still a problem, then I'll be able to make a quote and we'll be able to call the customer. But So I get a couple little rags, toss them right under the shift linkage assembly. Then I get a 7 16th wrench. into the back. All right, with well this particular cover assembly, it has this little cover and then a little metal washer that goes behind it. And then I can get back and behind the primary with this quarter inch bit and this very short wobble extension. And then you can get right back into the screw. And nine out of 10 times you do that and then you can put a ratchet on here and then tighten it down. And the slop is usually in between the splines of the spline shaft that goes into the transmission and this little arm. Nine out of 10 times. But it's a good thing that we checked before we said anything. Because this amount of looseness, like, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it is unusual. And it's definitely unusual for 8,000 miles. So that's what we did. We got in here and we tightened it up and it made no change, which is unusual, like I'm saying. So then I loosened the screw up, made sure that the shaft was, that the lever was all the way on the shaft, and then really cranked it down. And it still has the same amount of looseness. So that is unusual. So I double checked on our computer system. This vehicle does have a extended service program on it. So we will probably be calling the customer and uh, getting into this and seeing exactly what the deal is. So I'm interested to see, but we'll come back to that. Let's tighten up the rest of the front part of the shifter linkage and just put this back together for the time being and continue on with our safety inspection. You might as well just do the very simple fix not that nine out of 10 times fixes a, a situation. And then if it needs more getting into, then you call the customer and get into that end of it. So we still have where it has a little bit of slop. We're going to be using, again, you want to use a really high quality socket for this because you don't get a whole lot of, it doesn't fit into the, the screw very far. It's a 3 16 
you just get behind the shifter lever, loosen it up. Before we loosen it up, I measure how far the toe shifter is off the footboard. And I do it by fingers. We're just above three fingers on the toe, around the heel actually. Again, we put that there. Pull the screw all the way out. Undo it. So, what we're going to do is there was just a little bit of slop. We're going to com come in here and I'm going to put some wheel bearing grease, just a very light film, since I already have it out. I'm going to do that right now, just like that. Just the lightest, littlest film. Just for corrosion protection, you know? It really isn't like gonna help it slide that much really, but. Then we pop it in there and then we pull it off and then kind of squeegee any of the excess off. Then stick it back in. And then reapply it to the spline shaft. So the way that this is supposed to fit, we want to make sure that our measurement's right, is the spline shaft really only slides through this back shaft until it's flush. Or just a hair more, like protruding past this left last shifter linkage. You'll know what I mean when you go and just stick your finger back there. So we have it in there loosely. And then we're going to tighten it down. Nice and tight. And then we can see here that there, there's something kind of weird because the shaft is already inside of this lever. It isn't protruding, it isn't flush, it's inset. The whole concept here is that there's this rubber bushing and if you loosen up the levers, you can put a slight amount of side tension on it and it will eliminate any type of clunking like that. So we're going to loosen up our levers. Just so that they're loose. And then we're going to push them in just with a slight amount of side tension. And then we're going to tighten our screws back down and just snug them up. Just enough to hold their position. Just like so. Just like so. And then you give them some love. And just like that. Just like that. So now what we have is, see, there is literally no slop in it now. You can't hear anything. And it looks right because it's a lot closer to being flush. Well, that's just a good visual indication of how, like, what's going on. But there is no side-to-side -side slop. This back lever, no matter what, whether it has side tension on it or not, will wear a weird, weird groove in the back of the primary with time of shifting forward and backwards. When I have the primary off, for service reasons, you know, like if I'm in there doing stuff and the bike has higher mileage on it, I will file that flat and then you can still get side tension on it so everything moves properly. But just a little trick there. I've seen where people put springs and washers and all sorts of crazy business in here. Like the bike was already engineered with that little rubber bushing. And that's what it's for. But that type of movement there is unusual for this mileage. So like I was saying, this bike has ESP on it, which is the extended service program. So like to fix this it will probably only cost the customer $50. That's the deductible. Let's keep on going with the safety inspection. We've lowered the bike down. We've made mention about the shift linkage on the work order. 
but everything else is looking in good condition. Like the tires could be better, the belt could be tighter, but uh, no real problems. So the next thing that I like to do, like I said, I like to work my way up. So we started at the bottom and then now we're gonna be popping the seat off, checking the battery connections and the ground connections on the frame there and then work our way around. So let me show you how I do that. So I use my long screwdriver. Pop off the seat strap here. I don't know why, but I always like to do the left hand side. And then we're gonna open the tour pack. It makes it easier to get to. We're gonna lift this little wire cover deal. Careful with our screwdriver. Get back in the screw and pull it out. This bike has a heated seat on it. I don't know if you can tell, but there's controls on the side, so we don't want to just yank it off. It looks like it also has some additional wiring in there for like heated gloves or a heated vest. So we unplug it. Start taking a look and see, see what we see. We see some situations. So now I like to get in here and start looking around and just make sure the wiring is looking right, that there isn't any like obvious corrosion in these connectors. Like that one, that one is pretty corroded. You can see it on my, my hand already. So that is definitely not a good sign. I guess this goes probably beyond safety inspection, but like I said, I do this just like a service basically. And that's the kind of stuff that you want to check out is everything. You want to make sure that speaker grills are on, that they aren't hanging outside of the speaker boxes because the well nuts can be tricky if somebody had to replace a speaker. Look, make sure that none of the wiring is sh chafing on anything. There's a situation here with the ECM tray. I don't know if you can tell, but it's everything's wampus and above the frame of the seat, and that's abnormal. The front of the battery tray isn't latched in correctly, so everything's sitting high. So that means that we'll have to pull the battery tray out. And then we'll be able to check the connections on the battery, make sure that they're tight and clean. And then we'll be able to put the battery tray back in correctly but we want to see that everything is looking good through here. I like to push on and bop the, the fuel cover on these, on these newer motorcycles, because they're so annoying. It's like almost half of the bikes I ride, when I test ride them, this is rattling. And there, it's like this rubber part here isn't tall enough. So I have little foam pads that I, I put in here. So it makes it a little tighter fit when you shut it and then it doesn't rattle. That's usually just like, they rattle like a mofo and it's so friggin' annoying. Let's take a look at the tour pack stuff. I like to just look around the little plastic grommets for the tour pack rack. Make sure that there isn't any, any type of weird like looseness or buckling or anything. Everything's looking good there. You want to check out your tether that everything's tensioned and correct in there. Same with the rubbers on the backrest. There's three rubber isolators in it. You want to make sure that they're in good shape and not broken. And then you want to look at your antennas. This one feels kind of funny. Just that it's like loose. But this one has like a real a real situation going on. Oh, look at that. So right there. You see everything's all loose. And and it's rusted and corroded. Which is not good. Not good at all. It is on the correct side though. That's the other thing is you want to make sure that your antennas are on the correct side if you have two of them. This one's AM-FM. 
I wonder if he was having like poor AM FM reception and was in here like because this was already popped up weirdly like that. If he was having poor like AM FM reception and it had been like jerking around with it. Probably because there's a lot of corrosion up there in that front connector. That's what I'm saying. Like, I kind of just let the bikes talk to me a little bit. This one's a CVO, so when you turn it on and turn it off, the perimeter lighting comes on. You want to make sure that, that that's working because you want all your cool shit working, right? So we're going to make a note about that on a work order. I just do it like this because I forget stuff. Also, my spelling is atrocious, so don't judge me. So that's looking right. We want to look at the mirrors. Make sure that the mirrors are nice and tight. So off camera, so off camera, I popped off the battery tray and the ECM and all of that. And then put the, and then check the battery cables because you want to make sure that they're tight. Loose battery cables are gonna give you a whole lot of funky problems. Make sure that they're nice and tight. And then I put everything back correctly. Let's see if you can tell, but now that the wiring and the ECM is all below the surface of the frame rail, which is normal, the way that it should be. Because you don't want this, all this stuff bouncing off the bottom of your seat. That's the whole idea here is that you have this and then a little bit of a air gap and then the bottom of the seat. So then we just have the rest of the heated gear wiring that the customer had wired up through the backrest hole. And then on this side, I ran the battery tender lead. It was hanging hanging down, if you saw it earlier. I don't know if I mentioned it, but I like to leave them right up here, right by the fender, or right next to the seat strap. So all of that's all checked and buttoned up. Then you wanna come up front, and then we already checked the master cylinder and everything's all good there with the brake fluid. You wanna feel your grip, make sure that you have a little bit of end play, which is correct. You don't want it so tight that the grip doesn't like return, but you wanna feel it and make sure that it returns correctly and accurately. And then you also wanna check your clutch switch. So like we were seeing earlier about how the front brake light switch wasn't working, these models are kind of prone to the clutch interlock switch not working so that would create like a situation where you're in gear let's turn the bike on and say you're in first gear and you're ready to go and you just you click the start button because you thought it was in neutral and you weren't paying attention if the clutch lever's out, then the bike's gonna start jerking and trying to start and pushing you. And that's not cool. So we wanna check it. And it's working correctly. So the bike won't start until you pull the clutch in. And that is working. I'll just pop it back in neutral. We're gonna turn the heated grips on, let that warm up. Check the gauges, make sure that the lights are working that everything is working correctly there. I like to check the little air deflector button. Just make sure that's cool. We only want to call the customer once and get authorization for something and then ultimately complete the repair and then give them a second call, tell them that it's all done and that he can come and pick it up. We don't want to like start calling and go, oh, the primary or the shifter linkage was funky Oh, and then we saw the antenna, and then, oh, the air deflector button. So that's why I try to be as detailed as I can be, just right off the get-go. It just makes the whole process, in the end, a lot easier. Like, we want to check the heated grips now and make sure that they work. Because once he gets the bike back, here in Michigan, it's still going to be chilly. If he gets the bike back and the heated grips don't work, because we didn't check that, uh, then we, I would look stupid. The rest of the hand control buttons. Make sure that nothing funny has happened. Everything's looking good. The heated grips are already warming up, so that's all good. If you have a hydraulic clutch, 
She want to check the level on that. She's good. Like we said, the front brake, we already did, and that's all good. So we're gonna put the seat back on this bad boy for the time being. I like to put the seat in the saddlebag back on it because I work on a lot of motorcycles around here. And I don't like having a lot of extra parts laying around. So I like to keep the bikes together as possible. So if the customer approves things, then it's just easy to pop these things off. And then if he says, no, I don't want to do that stuff or I'll bring it back later or something, then he, he can just go ahead and take it. So I didn't have that incorrectly. Now it's good. That is also funny, but now that's good too. So we're just gonna pop the seat back on it and the saddle bags. So the last thing that we needed to do before warming it up and changing the oil is checking the coolant. So you always wanna look in the bottle obviously, but the bottle could have the correct amount and it could be low in here. And it is low. So that is unusual for it to be low. You know, it could be low because somebody had opened the cooling system, replaced some stuff, and then didn't bleed it correctly. Or it could be low because it's leaking. So we want to go around and give it a, a very detailed look and look for any type of coolant leaks. So the radiators are in the lower fairings, and then there's coolant hoses that go up around the front up on top of the engine into the cylinder heads and then down into the coolant pump it's down in here and then back over to this other side also just total system wise and we want to look for orange leakage and I don't know if you can tell but that looks like it's orange to me right there like This part looks like dirt, and this part looks like it's orange coolant, possibly. Oh, son of a bitch. Right there. Can you see it? We do have a coolant leak. Maybe you can see it. We're running right at the bottom of here. So these two screws can be a real pain in the butt to get out sometimes because they're they have Loctite on them and a brass ferrule. But we're gonna have to pop that off. So now that we have the lower fairing off, well at least uh, you know the front side, the part that you normally see, that is off and we can see the guts. And let's check for where we see it leaking coolant. And you can see that, well maybe you can see, but there's little crusties on here, right there. And that's evidence of a leaking coolant. So once the system gets hot, builds a little bit of pressure, it leaks around the threads. This is the coolant temperature sensor. It tells the engine if the cooling system is working. We might as well also pull the connector off and look at the pins. Make sure none of that's all janky. But that's also it. The bike's leaking coolant from this coolant temp sensor. So. Normally on a, on a typical vehicle, uh, I wouldn't just naturally pull this off, but we have to because the, the bike has ESP on it. And with ESP, you have to have everything disassembled, know exactly what it's going to take, and then call them with a quote, and then they approve it. So. so this turned into a bit more of a project than we were originally expecting. I was hoping it was just going to be a simple uh, run through of the inspection since this thing only has 8,000 miles on it but 
That's exactly why we do safety inspections. So that's exactly what the customer wanted. He brought it in so that we would do a safety inspection and an oil change on it. It happens to work out well for him that he has ESP on it. And then we'll call and uh, get approval to take the primary and the transmission apart and look more into that shifter linkage situation. It is out of warranty. I've already checked. But he has a $50 deductible. So fixing all of this up will likely only call him, cost him $50 as far as the antenna, that coolant leak, the shifter linkage situation. So that works out good for him. And that's really what this is all about as far as the safety inspection is. The customer wants to have a good experience and that's what we're trying to do. You know, this could have turned into a large clusterfuck. You know, if he just pulls this bike out of storage, I'm sure he stored it at home, but you know, he just pulls it out of the garage, goes ride it, radio's not working right. Then it comes into the shop. Then the shack engine light comes on because it's leaking coolant. Then it's back into the shop. Then the shifter shaft, feeling funky, it could potentially be a third service visit. And that's exactly how people have bad, bad experiences. So we'll get all this stuff buttoned up and fixed up for him, I'm sure. And then he'll have a good experience of this riding season. So thanks for watching. Like and subscribe.